Brother Williams is away at camp meeting uh, this Sunday, so I get to fill in for him. I would much rather have Brother Larry here teaching the lesson as I thoroughly enjoy our Sunday school classes with him as our teacher. We are on lesson 10, which is the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. Our memory verse is found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, which says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. If we profess to be Christians, we should not, must not, cannot lie and be Christians. Instead, we should be noted for telling the truth. We should be above board, we should be honest in all things. The things that we do and the things that we say. The emphasis of this lesson has five parts to it. First emphasis is that it is sin to tell a lie. <coughs> Shock. It is sin to tell a lie. Number two, God is true and God never lies. And three, on the opposite side of that, the devil is a liar and he is the father of lies. Number four, here's the hard part, all liars must go to hell. Boy, that's, that's a powerful statement. With the permissive attitude that so many people have with regard to lying and um, these things, they never seem to realize that lying is a serious, serious thing. That it is sin. And sin carries with it the penalty of eternal death. And so when they tell those little white lies, when they fib, they're not thinking about putting their eternity in jeopardy. And then finally, the good news is that Jesus saves from lying. He saves us from all sin, including the sins of lying. So as we look at this commandment, we think about the commandment we studied last week, thou shalt not steal. And we look at this one, thou shalt not bear false witness. And we do see that there is a connection between the two because both of those commandments require honesty of heart and sincerity. Our foundation text is the commandment that we find in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, verse 16, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. What is false witness? Well, certainly it is lying. But when we look at these two words, the word false is an untruth something that's not true. And to witness is to give testimony. So the commandment in uh, simpler terms is don't give untruthful testimony against another person. That's really what that says when parsed down. So we are not to tell an untruth about a person or to a person. Uh, the writer of our Sunday School uh, quarterly says, this comes from both a lying spirit and lack of love, and in many cases, blaming others for things we are guilty of doing. Uh, what do you think about that? Uh, does lying come from a lying spirit? If someone tells a lie, does that person have a, a lying spirit? 
how many of here have ever met a person with a real lying spirit? A lying spirit, a person with a lying spirit will lie when the truth would serve them better. They really would. I, I, I remember one person, and this was years and years and years ago. Uh, it was a young man. And this man to seem like he could not tell the truth in any circumstance. Uh, if uh, you say, boy, look, the, the sun's shining, it's a pretty day, he'd almost come say, well, it's raining and it's horrible out there. Just because that was the spirit that predominated his life. And as I got to know him, found out that when he was supposed to be working a job, he was off doing something else. Uh, one time, um, he wanted me to go to college, to the college with him. And I went down there and he had some business to do. And lo and behold, he wasn't even registered at that college. He said he was going to school there. And I found out the business that he was up to and it wasn't having anything doing with the school in fact, he was off campus, nothing related to the school. And the thing about it is, he had the nerve to have me go there with him. As if I was so dumb that I would not see the inconsistency. And that's one thing about people with lying spirits, is they do not see the inconsistency of what they say and what they do. And they do not realize that other people can see through them. This, it's really a pathetic thing. But I don't believe that every person that tells a lie has a lying spirit. People lie for all kinds of reasons. Mainly because uh, whatever the situation is, they are uncomfortable letting the truth be known. And it could be just something minor, like you know, I have been on uh, the Nutrisystem diet. I get these meals delivered, delivered to me in the mail, and that's all I eat, except for having to go into Brahms and getting the banana split and getting the pizza <laughs> over at the Pizza Hut and the hamburgers at uh, Burger King and so forth like that, uh, you know, they, they just don't want to admit the truth that they are their own worst enemy <laughs> and their actions, their behavior is undermining what they really want to do. <coughs> uh, all of us have encountered people at work, at home, friends, the neighbors, uh, just times when people would just say something to avoid telling the truth or to just please you. Well, okay, that's what you want to believe, okay, that's, that's the way it is. So I think probably an awful lot of lying among everyday people falls into this category. And then there are the politicians. <laughs> Uh, if you ever want to see professional liars, tune in to politicians. Now, having said that, I know we love to kick the politicians and condemn them and like that. Believe it or not, not every politician is a liar and crooked and self-serving. There are some very dedicated people holding public office and they are indeed trying to do the best that they can to help their constituents. But when it comes down to how many of these politicians are really good and honest people and how many are prevaricators, I kind of get the idea that a majority of politicians will say whatever needs to be said for them to get what they want. 
out of you in particular. So um, some of those people perhaps do indeed have a lying spirit. I won't mention any names, but I do believe that there are some faces that you see on your television uh, during these campaigns where the person behind that face does indeed have a lying spirit. And it can certainly be more than one or two that you will be seeing. And in many cases, blaming others for things we are guilty of doing. I believe a lot of lying has this as its basis. Uh, we want to escape the penalty of something that we have done. So it's just easier to prevaricate, to tell a lie, to misrepresent um, what happened so that we don't get penalized for it. This happens a lot in the workplace. Somebody does something they shouldn't have done or they uh, don't do something they should have done and eventually it gets seen by the supervisor, by the manager, by the president of the company. Uh, it's amazing how many people will just sit there and lie. Well, I did that, or I didn't do this, or, you know, uh, it was Sally Jane who, who did this. And I told people that worked for me, don't ever lie to me. If you lie to me, I will fire you. Tell the truth. No matter how embarrassing the truth may be, it is easier to forgive a mistake than to have you destroy your credibility to me. Because if you will lie to me, how can I trust you? How can I trust you? And there is the big issue about lying. Lying destroys relationships. And the closest relationship is the marriage relationship. Husbands and wives must not lie to each other. Okay? We acknowledge the fact that we're not perfect. I know and I have proved to myself innumerable times over the last 69 years I am not perfect. My wife is as close to perfect as any person can be, but sometimes she will overcook the sausage in the morning. <laughs> I like that. And we've discovered that it is best to be open and above board and to tell the truth. So how, yes ma'am. probably one of the biggest sources of lying between husbands and wives is money. Because money yes. problems are one of the leading problems in marriage and why many marriages end up in the divorce courts. And it is easy for people to spend money and then just try not to say anything about it. That is a form of lying. You know, when when you are one flesh, husband and wife together, you you, I mean, you're two people, but you're like one being. And supposedly, you know, whatever we have is ours. Mm -hmm. And if I take money and I misuse it, it's like I'm stealing from her. Thou shalt not steal, as we studied last week. And if I just quietly keep my mouth shut, I'm kind of 
presenting a false situation. Or, you know, you buy something and, oh, it was on sale. Well, let me tell you, everything in the store is on sale, <laughs> even if it's at full price. And how many people will say, well, it was on sale, so I, I bought it. Whether they need it or not. Whether they I need it or not. Now, I don't know about the men, but women. I know, because I've been around too many women like that to do something like it. You know, I'm saying, I'm just, and I'm looking at them like, you know, what are you, what do you think? You know, well, Sister Glenna is the uh, authority on, on women. Uh, I guess I will be the authority on men. When I was working, I, I had these young men that worked in my office. And they spent hundreds of dollars every month on games, on computer games. And one of these had a, a young growing family that needed the money. And, and his wife did not work outside of the home. She was a homemaker. And his family was dependent upon his income. Now, he made a good income, but he squandered an awful lot of money just on computer games. What a waste. <laughs> that, that kind of goes back to the stealing situation. But uh, the lying comes in, well, why are you spending that money on the games? Well, I'm so stressed out from work that I, I need to relax when I get home and the game is what I use to relax. Probably 110 times out of 100, that's a lie. A lot of times other people do even less work too. Well, I won't say anything about that. <laughs> but uh, uh, the truth of the matter is, he just wants to play the game. And it has nothing to do with being stressed out. In fact, um, I imagine he probably experiences more stress from the game than he experienced at work. So there's all kinds of causes for lying. Some of them definitely are um, possession by a lying spirit. A lot of time lying is perceived to be self-preservation. Uh, as we've discussed. So uh, it's not a good thing. But the scripture says uh, not to uh, give an untrue testimony, false witness. It's, it's evil and bad when we lie about things. But it is worse when we lie about people. People have a reputation. And if we lie about a person, we undermine that reputation. I have known good people that lies have been put out about them. And it casts suspicion on those people, even though there's no evidence. And at times, like in the work situation, uh, good people have been denied promotions that they deserve, that actually earned, because somebody lied on them, told something that wasn't true. That is wrong. Mm -hmm. One of the worst things that happens in, in society is gossip. Gossip. What is gossip? Somebody tell me what gossip is. Telling each other things, telling each other people. Just talking about other people. Talking and listening. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, a lot of that is lying. Because there's different ways they keep seeing different things. Yeah. How many of you have ever had someone? Give you gossip. Yeah. 
that we all have. And what, what is your first response when somebody is sitting there talking to you? Do, do you know where Sally Jane was last night? She hung out at this tavern until 2 o'clock in the morning. And she's a kindergarten teacher. She shouldn't be doing that. And she was with some guy that I know wasn't her husband. First question I ask is, how do you know? Were you there too? <laughs> well, no, I, I heard it from, uh, you know, Frida. Frida told it. And, and where did Frida hear it from? Well, she heard it from Carol. <laughs> you know how these things, they just go and they go and they go. And it grows and it goes. Sorry? It grows and it goes. It seems to grow. And instead of having one head, uh, she ends up having ten hints before the whole story is uh, told. Um, gossip is very destructive, very harmful to people. And it harms the people that gossip because it undermines your own credibility as well. Well, let's go on to Ephesians 4.25, which is our memory verse. It says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Paul is writing to the Christians here. If you profess to be a Christian, do not lie. Instead, speak the truth. Just tell the truth. What do you mean by telling the truth? Well, <clears throat> Sister Gladys works, walks into the church building this morning and I mean, you know, she has two different shoes <coughs> on. Her top doesn't match her skirt. Her hair is half done up. And she looks like a cold cup of coffee. I don't want to see that. So she walks in. What do you say? Hi, sister, you look like a train wreck today. Glad to see you. <laughs> Speak the truth, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> how about instead we say, hello, sister, good to see you this morning. Is that all right to say? Mm -hmm. Is that telling a lie? Is that bearing false witness? <laughs> Only if you're not glad to see her. But, you know, we would be glad to see her. Uh, hi, sister. Glad to see you. I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, speak the truth. Uh, the quarterly says when God saves one, he takes lying from his heart. And why is that? Well, because if we're in Christ, we are a new creation. We're made over again. And lying has no place in our spirit, in our being whatsoever. Uh, it's an interesting comment here. Would we not lie to ourselves? Excuse me, we would not lie to ourselves, would we? <laughs> and I put a little uh, comment to the side of that says, but people do it all the time. People will lie to themselves all the time. As Christians, should we lie to ourselves? Well, you're not saying anything to me. You're not saying anything to anybody else. But if you do that to yourself, then it's going to carry out. It's going to be <clears throat> Well, if you lie to yourself, who hears that lie? God hears that lie. You hear that lie. And in reality, you know what you are saying to yourself about yourself isn't true. That's self-deception. You know, if you do something that bothers your conscience, you don't want to deny to, to, to lie to yourself. You need to be honest. And get before God and say, Lord, you know, I did this 
help me to understand was it wrong and what do I need to do to make it right to you. Too many people will just quote that, just push it down. And that's a form of lying to yourself. Well, I'm okay. I didn't mean to blah, 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 blah. They will excuse themselves and things that they say, things that they do that bothers their conscience. If you do something that bothers your conscience, you should get before God, first of all, and ask God for clarification. And if that doesn't seem to resolve the issue, not because God doesn't want you to know, but maybe God wants you to humble yourself and go another route. Maybe you talk with your spouse, your parent, a trusted person in the congregation, your pastor. You know, well, I, I said this the other day, and it's bothered my, my conscience. Help me to understand, did I do something wrong? I said, well, and we could counsel with you on that point. And that could be God's way of resolving the issue. Um, you know, we kind of like to take care of those things in the quiet of our own little private lives so that nobody will know. But when we take that position, that's usually when God will step in and say, no, let's be open and above board about this. Let's be public. You know, we, we still have a prayer bench here in the church building. And that prayer bench is there for people to come to to pray. We like it when people, you know, want to get saved. They, they come down here and they pray and they ask for help. But sometimes people that have been in the Christian life for a long time, they, they're kind of afraid to go down there because they begin to get the idea that, well, maybe th people think that I'm a hypocrite or I'm messed up or something like that. There should be no fear in the prayer bench. If your heart's troubled, you need to come and seek God and pray. Not every time do you need to talk to the pastor or a counselor. Um, you know, you can just come and pray. And you've done it openly, publicly. And when God has helped you, you can just get up and go back to your seat. Sometimes you can say, look, I need somebody to help me through this and we can counsel and then pray. So let's not lie to ourselves, but let's be honest, open, and above board. Now going back to the book of Proverbs chapter 6, there's a whole list of things dealing with honesty. The writer says, these six things does the Lord hate. Wow, some things God hates. Do you want to do anything God hates? Okay. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. So that tells me that if you do something that God hates, you are making yourself an abomination to God. You're not in a right standing with God. And he lists these things. He says, a proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. I like the way the orderly talks about these things. Each of those things has something false about them. And the commandment is, thou shalt not bear false witness. The first thing that was mentioned is a proud look. God hates a proud look. What is a proud look? Well, it is a false estimate of one's relative importance. We're thinking too highly of oneself. Or thinking too lowly of others. We never look at others downward. We always look on an even plane. Okay? We never never look in the mirror 
and see ourselves way up here. Because, hey, our feet walk on planet Earth. And we are subject to the world around us like that. Um, well, I tell you what. How many of you have ever read a resume? You know what a resume is. That's when somebody writes down you know, their qualifications and experience when they're applying for a job. I tell you what, I don't know how many hundreds and hundreds of resumes I have ever read. But an awful lot of them gave a false estimate of the person's relative importance. <laughs> they really did. And it's amazing, you know, there, there are coaches out there that will coach people on how to pad their resume. In other words, they'll coach them on how to lie. You know, uh, I ate in the cafeteria, therefore I've had food management experience. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I go by and you know, I take the food off the counter and like that and I see what they're doing back there. So, hey, I can do that. Therefore, I have food management experience. <laughs> Somebody sits at a desk and they sharpen pencils and they take papers from the uh, in basket to the box. The boss's desk and the desk, papers off the boss's desk into the out basket and they have clerical experience. Well, do you type? Yes. I type 85 words a minute. Oh, really? Yes. E-I-G-H-T-Y space W-O-R-D S space A space M-I-N-R. Oh. You, you see what I'm typing 80 words a minute. You know, I'm exaggerating the example a little bit, but it's really pathetic when you believe somebody's resume and you hire them and you say, well, here's your job. You say that you know how to do this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, you know, you show them how we do it here. And after nine weeks, they still don't know how to do the job and you have to terminate the person. Now, I like it when a person is truthful. I hired a lady for a job uh, having to do with uh, the automated, automated clearinghouse uh, process uh, in, in, in the financial institution. And she was actually a teller at, when we hired her at the credit union. But she had on her resume that she did this kind of work at this credit union someplace else. And that's all she said. She didn't say, you know, how good she was at it. She just said, I did that. And I observed this lady working, you know, as a teller. And she had a very good work ethic. So when that job came open in my department, I hired her for that job. That lady knew exactly what she was doing. Nobody had to show her anything. She was intelligent. She figured out how we did it in there on her own. I didn't have to explain anything to her. And that was truly a blessing. And that lady still works there doing that same job. She is that good. It's really nice when you, know, you hire someone and they really can do the work that you want them to do. It's really a disappointment when you hire a person for the job and you find out that they gave a false estimate of their relative importance. The proud look. A lying tongue. False words. Need we say any more? Shed innocent blood. How does that involve thou shalt not bear false witness? Well, they liken here to false treatment of others. When we treat people wrongly, you ever start, stop to think that that's a form of false witness? 
we aren't treating them as they deserve. We are treating them wrongly. And that is a false witness. They don't deserve that. They deserve to be treated correctly. The heart uh, given to wicked imaginations, false thinking. Boy, let me tell you, there's a lot of that going around. Um, some people just will not face reality in their circumstances, about themselves, uh, about things. I mean, just, they will not face reality. So they invent a reality uh, that they live in. It's false thinking. Feet swift to mischief. Um, having false values. Choosing to do wrong as if it was good. Kind of like doing the wrong thing for the right reason. How many have ever heard that expression? How many of us perhaps have ever done the wrong thing for the right reason? Well, let me tell you what, it's still a wrong thing. If you're in that kind of a, a double bind, you need to really seek counsel, pray, how to deal with the situation so that you don't do the wrong thing. False witness, that's a false testimony against a person. Um, and, and that's the direct statement in the commandment. And then number seven, sowing discord <coughs> among brethren. Oh, I tell you what, this is one of the worst things that anyone can do. It's bad in a family. It's bad at work. Well, I tell you, you know, I used to hate it when the rumor mill at work would get active. Uh, because it's just like the wolves were after the deer, you know, and going for the throat. Just, just didn't hurt the one person. It hurt the whole credit unit. Uh, everybody was hurt by what was going on. And nothing was uh, benefit from it. But among the saints of God, there sometimes can be discord and that we will disagree on things. Uh, it can be anything, you know, what kind of bushes to plant out front of the church pond, what kind of flowers to have in front of the pulpit. Uh, uh, that's my pillow that you're sitting on. Here, take this one. Uh, you know, it can be anything, you know, that, that happens, okay? Well, we need to learn to deal with those things. They can happen, okay? That's just human nature. But sowing discord, that's making it happen. And that is absolutely wrong. Among the people of God, we should strive to be at peace with one another. Uh, if we are hurt by something someone says or, or does, we should first of all try to live with that, accept that and go on, forgive. If it continues to be a problem, then you know, go to that person and say, well, you know, I know you weren't trying to hurt me, but you said this and you keep saying this and it really bothers me. And, you know, could you not say it that way anymore? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I was doing that. So, uh, you know, there, there are ways to go around. And boy, when somebody comes in the midst and they're trying to get their way, they want, they're going to sow discord. They're going around to find out who they can get on their side. And then they will start tearing down the people that aren't uh, on their side. And most of the time, it starts, I mean, it's, the object is up here, the pastor, the ministry, the church. Somebody doesn't like the preacher because of what he's preaching on, because it's getting next to them. So they look for confederates in the congregation. And then they will start sowing discord. And they'll try to get a faction to turn against not just the pastor, but also the people that are, you know, 
supporting the master. So it's an evil, evil thing. Keep in mind, the body, uh, the church is the body of Christ. And discord is a virus. It's a cancer that will destroy the body. And it is a shameful, shameful thing in a community when a church has a church problem and it blows up and the community knows about it. That kills a congregation. Going on, Psalm 51, verse 6, it says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Uh, under points to consider on page 54, the section Effect of Truth. It addresses what is said in that verse. It says, A true heart causes one to, number one, tell the truth, even though you suffer for it. Tell the truth even when you suffer some kind of a consequence for it. A true heart causes one to believe God. People who can't believe God are being dishonest with themselves. That's the truth of the matter. A true heart causes one to keep the promises that they want to keep. Right? That's not what the, the writer of the Sunday School lesson wrote. It says keep all promises. If you make a promise, keep the promise. The true heart will do that. Now, I realize that we live in a real world and have real life. Sometimes we cannot keep a promise that we make because of circumstances beyond our control. Okay? Now, this is not making a promise that we really didn't mean to keep. It's just we meant it, we gave a promise, we meant to do it, but something happens and we can't keep the promise. It's best that we will tell that person, look, I made a promise to you, I cannot keep that promise because. And give as much of the reason as is necessary to give. It may be something that you can't really disclose to somebody uh, you know, else. It may be something personal or like that that just does not need to be talked about. Uh, sometimes, you know, people make a promise to do this, and then somebody calls up and says, hey, well, let's, let's, let's go up to Oklahoma City to go shopping. So, well, I made a promise to do this. Okay, I'll get out of it. And so we call and say, well, look, something's come up. I can't go with you. All right, you're being dishonest. You say, I just really want to go shopping. And I don't want to keep my promise. Better to tell the person that called you, look, I've made a promise. You don't have to say what or to whom, but I've made a promise on that day that I have to keep. So perhaps we can go up the city another time. Well, I'm not going to go for another six months. I'll call in six months. Okay. Uh, a true heart causes one to be frank and open, concealing nothing. Does that mean we have to tell everything? There's just some things that other people don't need to know. They need to know of an event, perhaps. But they don't need necessarily to know all the whys and wherefores and, and whodunits and things of that nature. Well, I mean, I know some people that, boy, they're going to tell you this and they're going to tell you everything. Everything. And I'm thinking, I don't need to know any of this other than the first thing that you said. Why don't you just be quiet? I almost said shut up, but that's deemed to be crude. Why don't you just be quiet? But you know, and saying everything, 
we can do more damage than good. We do need to be honest, to be frank with people. Uh, and sometimes frank is, uh, uh, oh, uh, what happened there? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. That's being frank. Does this person really know, need to know what that person said or did over there? Are they involved in it? Now, well, be frank. You just don't need to know. I'm not going to tell. <coughs> Seven, a true heart causes people to act honestly, whether or not it will be known. Act honestly if people see it or if people don't see it. The greatest deeds of honesty are done when no one else can see it. When no one else can see it. Wow. Don't we kind of like to brag on ourselves? We do something good. Do you remember in the story a man called Norman? and the preacher who Norman was kind of his test case. And remember that time he, I think, took Norman to the ice cream shop or something like that. And he kind of had this idea, hey everybody, look, I'm helping Norman. This crazy weird Norman, I'm helping Norman. Me, I'm helping Norman. Nobody else will help Norman. I'm helping Norman. <laughs> Well, <laughs> if you remember that story, God soon chastised uh, that brother for carrying on like that. Uh, who needs to know that you gave the poor homeless person a $20 bill? Or gave them some food? Or a couple of bottles of water on a hot day? Isn't it enough that that person knows well, hi, my name is George, and I am doing this for you. Remember, my name's George. Uh, that, that doesn't cut it. You know, when, when people do stuff like that, I can just see God in heaven just holds his nostrils and says, boy, that stinks. A true heart causes one to have a trustful attitude toward others. This is not an easy thing to do. Um, it's, it's good to trust people, but sometimes we can get hurt trusting people. You know, in my professional career, I was a, an, an internal auditor for many years. And whenever I would go into a bank credit union, go into a department, I did not want to believe that these people were a bunch of criminals. But I did know that some of these people could be criminals, could be dishonest, could be corrupt. Okay. So I would go in trusting and then when I would find the corruption, the dishonesty, it genuinely hurt me. Now most of the audits I did were perfectly good audits. You know, the findings were all small stuff. But there were times when I actually caught people doing criminal things. and. Uh, in many cases, some of these people actually went to jail and served prison sentences. I still basically like to trust people, but I know that I trust people with a reserve until they've earned my trust. And pastoral ministry is a challenge because when you deal with people, you want to trust them. But you have to also realize that sometimes people will abuse that trust. 
and they will hurt you. Uh, it causes us to um, do his best work. Do nothing to present false appearance and do nothing to defraud another. The last sentence is a true hearted person is no hypocrite. That's true. So, Titus chapter 1 verse 2 tells us that God cannot lie. And in John 8 44, it says that the devil does not abide in truth, and no truth is in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Here we have in Scripture the contrast between ultimate good and ultimate evil, between absolute truth and absolute evil. God is the truth. And if we pro profess to be God's people, if we profess to be born again, to be born of the Spirit, to have the Spirit of God, we cannot lie because God will not lie. And if we tell lies and all these misrepresentations and things that we've talked about, we're actually siding with the father of lies against the God of all truth. And finally, Revelation 22, 15 and 21, 8. The Bible says, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loves and maketh a lie. Uh, in the context, those are people that will not have access to the tree of life. And then in Revelation 21, 8, it says, All liars. go to the lake of fire. They don't go to heaven in eternity to be with God. So how important is honesty, truthfulness? How dangerous is lying? Is there any such thing as a, a harmless lie? Oh, it was just a harmless lie. No. At least one person is harmed whenever a lie is told. And that's the person telling the lie. God expects us to be honest in our dealings with people, to be truthful in our conversations, to use discretion in talking about things so that we're not gossips, that we are frank, we say what needs to be said to whoever needs to hear it. And we don't tell them more than is necessary. And on the other hand, when we're talking to someone who needs to know, we tell them everything that they need to know. We don't hold back the truth, the facts. That's just as much lying and being dishonest as the other is. So that is our approach to the commandment, thou shalt not bear false witness. I invite you all to come back next Sunday when we'll be looking at the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. And boy, let me tell you, this is a constant challenge even to the people of God. Why? Is it because there's something wrong in our spirit? No. Because we are material beings living in a material world and we have material needs. So just something about being human where coveting is a real stumbling block. Amen.